For those not too familiar with Welsh culture, located somewhere between pretending to know about Dylan Thomas and changing language when an Englishman walks into the room, is a beloved national treasure called Max. Boyce. A songwriter, comedian and poet, Boyce is maybe the great folk chronicler of modern Wales, a genius wordsmith for comic styling that inspired several generations of embarrassing uncles. One of Boyce's biggest hits came in 1974 when he told us all the story, a strange and weird tale of a factory in his valley not fed by road or rail. The outside half factory, a song about the warehouse pumping out tents to pull on the red jersey one day, fell fast into folklore. The poem tracks Boyce himself, his father, an old timer called Harry Dampers, and briefly, a bloke called Ron who cracks the mould of solid gold that once made Barry John. Over a few weeks churning out tents to one day win against England. It's a song that would have worked in no other nation. The fly half shirt in Wales holds a near mythical legendary status. There's few jerseys in world sport that carry as much prestige and expectation as the Welsh number 10. The song turns 50 this year, yet the national obsession with soft touch, fast think, fleet foot playmakers not just continues to this day, but dates back 120 years to when Will of the Wisp Percy Bush tore up the pre-war era. Rugby might have changed in the century plus since, but what the game represents to Wales has always been reflected in its number 10. Cliffy and Di were the dream. Benny and Barry gave us romanticism, poetry and escape. Jiffy, optimism in a difficult time. Jenks and Welly solidity when we needed it most. And over the last decade, Dan Bigger has personified Welsh rugby like nobody else. Maybe not the most talented player in the world, but there's no bugger with more grit, more spirit, more will to work and want to win. And yet, just as when that fitter's mate Ron broke the mould of solid gold, it seems the factory has fallen into existential crisis. Six years ago, in just the fourth video on this channel, I decided to wade into the debate between the shirts contenders at the time. Dan Bigger, Gareth Anscombe, Reese Patchell and Sam Davis. But in the years since then, the landscape has changed. Bigger has retired a legend. Ans comes off to Japan a hero. Patchell has taken himself out of consideration, moving to New Zealand to rekindle, expand, explore, improve. And, best of all, Sam de Pompadour has become a huge hit in France, the best thing to happen to the Pro Day Dust since they declared TMO's persona non grata, and in their place stands kids. The total exit of experience now leaves Wales in a fascinating position. Never before has the battle for Max's mythicised shirt been so wide open, so exciting, and so there to be won. So, who are the all exceptionally young contenders to wear that Welsh number 10 jersey this Six Nations and beyond? How do they each fit into the picture and what kind of state does this leave Wales in? It's been an odd Six Nations for Cymru so far. Three losses have prompted relative optimism, a horror show first half against Scotland turning into something remarkable that carried over into a best ever Welsh first half at Twickenham before the young squad put up a proper fight against the best side in the world for at least an hour or so. And yet, the opening two games saw three different players slot in at 10, the starter shifting week on week and leaving us no close to knowing who wears that shirt permanently going forwards. As such, it's weird to call anyone the guy in possession at the minute, but if any player came into this championship with cash in the bank, it's World Player of the Year 2027, Sam Costello. The only one of the current options that tend to attend the group photo for Wales' 2023 World Cup squad, Costello burst onto the Welsh rugby hipster radar not long after that video six years ago, as he put in an utterly spellbinding performance at 10 for Wales under-18s, winning a game single-handedly against England before stepping up to under-20s level the next year and doing the same two years in a row. This beautiful pass usurped a year later by a lovely try and gorgeous late drop goal to earmark himself as the man who shall one day be. Sammy sure to succeed Danny in the lineage of Cliffy and Jeffy and Benny and Barry. Since then his rise has been definite but never quite smooth. Signing for the Scarlets and quickly making the 10 jersey his own. His first cap coming in a hammering and second in the embarrassing loss to Georgia one week later. He then missed out on the 2023 Six Nations squad before being recalled for the World Cup warm-ups, putting in a brilliant performance, wouldn't you know it, against England, guiding Wales to a win before an encouraging, if inconsistent, run at the World Cup. His one start during that tournament, and to date the only one of his 11 caps where he's played the full 80 minutes, came against Georgia, where he was thrown in last minute after an injury in the warm-up to Gareth Anscombe. And for me, it was a really solid, good performance that clearly illustrates exactly where he's at. Often a player who needs to feel his way into games, the opening stages seemed harried as he threw hospital balls and overcooked kicks, but when given a scrap, a chance to get on his own terms, that started to change. After surviving a Georgian attack, Costello opts to launch a kicking duel off this turnover ball and hits it into the area of the pitch unshielded from the sun, which, having been there on the ground that day, was an utter 
bastard that Saturday. Niniashvili tries to tennis it into the other corner, but Costello anticipates and covers brilliantly, firing this down the tram line. And whilst his opposite number Matt Carver covers, Georgia are steadily finding himself pushed further and further back, recovering a superbly placed kick under enormous pressure. Forced to find an angle to clear and gifting Tommy Turnover a chance to live up to his name, all thanks to some sublime tactical kicking from Sam Costello. Wales goes to the corner from there and a few phases later Tomas Francis flops over for the opening try. Settled, Costello grows into the game. This, in the dying minutes, is gorgeous simple rugby. After a great carry by Elliot D, Costello sets a simple pod and as Smith carries superbly, calls three forwards in to reload in front of him as he assesses the Georgian defence. Spotting this guy isn't folding the open side, he springs into action telling his teammates to spread wide, knowing they can isolate Kaveza Ladza and get Tom Brady or whoever the hell this is onto his outside, drawing the hatless Tabat Sadza to put North over in the corner. It was an ultimately excellent performance, it just took some time to get going. Costello is an interesting player as he fits into the mould international branches of the franchise fly half factory were big into about four or five years ago. A trend that gave us Roman Untermack, Paolo Garbisi, Nolo Vaseo, Rui Demant, Flaky George, Louis Carbonell, and plenty more beside, where instead of the traditional damn bigger, scruff of the neck leader or Percy Bush type playmaker, the 10 is more of an inside inside centre. It's stuff like this. Costello here for the under 20s calls a shape with centre and Iron Owen at first receiver. The usual play is for the 10 to then loop round into the boot this zone and look to bring one of his wider men here onto the ball, so Italy mark up as such, but instead Costello makes him of the inside tip on an arrowhead, hitting the hole against a defence who falls they numbered up against the 10 by marking Owen. His tiny dummy sells Varney and his burst of pace takes him to the try. This is perhaps Costello's USP, his ability to run an attack to open up space for himself. Here, Scarlet Sam sees a simple shape and hits a wider man off 10. Thompson positioned perfectly between several Ospreys, allowing him to shorten the defensive line. The offload to Hardy then allows him to play away quickly before Tipperick here can fully fold, but check how quickly Costello reloads. He gets onto the blind side and just sets one runner inside and outside right away, immediately spying how the Ospreys are set up. Not dissimilar to that Arrowhead formation from the under-20s. Williams' line forces Jack Mohan to turn in opening it up for Costello to accelerate through the gap and eventually go under the post to score and it's another try. Costello led the league for clean breaks from 10 in his first year and second the following season. His natural game always having him involved in the action is a bizarre strength but Costello is one of the best 10s I've ever seen at knowing when to carry in himself. After this break by Dyer, the Barbarians drift hard onto the open side and Costello recognises in a split second they need a quick phase in the middle to prevent the drift and shorten up the defence. A pass wide would allow Hooper to drift right out to the wing and so they need to tie him in if they're to unlock this space on the short side. But where most turns would hit hooker Dewey Lake here on the short ball and then drift round onto that side themselves, Costello spots Valentini is drifting onto his built different teammate so accelerates into the gap himself, smashing well over the gain line with the added bonus Lake can now clear out allowing for a quicker ball with Hooper and Valentini totally tied in than if he'd had to wait for another forward to come in or hit the ruck himself. Williams' wide pass leaves Ravitamanda isolated so he rushes up and North can then just bod the ball to Tom Rogers who walks it in from there. This is vastly different to how the 10 has traditionally acted in a Warren Gatland team, where the role is more of a quarterback, a tactician, whose job is to manage the game, especially in the 22, and get the best out of others around them. However, Gatland has also always been one to adjust, rebuild, and wire his tactics to the pieces he has available, changing game plans entirely if the players didn't suit. And at points against Ireland, we saw Wales start to run an attack that felt extremely Costello. This passage is lovely. Off a rare burst of front football, Wales opening a small gap for Costello, only for him to throw it beautifully over the top. Nash harrying so hard, Dyer can step in with ease, and next phase, Costello calls a lovely shape to target Doris here, but Raffle and Thomas overrun each of their lines, both of them do, making it an easy read for Doris in the end and prompting Tompkins to knock it on. It's so almost clicking. Costello, for me, is an exceptional talent, still finding his voice in Test Rugby. And if his individual performance or anything to go by, there's a chance that takes some time, but it's going to be worth it. Yet, in a tournament like the Six Nations, and a position like Fly Half, very few are willing to be that patient especially in Wales which perhaps leads on to the other guy to don the shirt so far in 2024. In a country sufficiently enough built on dreams and nostalgia to make Max Boyce a generation spanning national legend it's no real surprise that the clamours to see a nippy sparky Johan Lloyd start at 10 have been going on so long they're actually older than several members of the current squad. Before joining the club at the heart of West Wales' favourite cult Johan Lloyd spent his weekends tarting about as a utility back for Bristol Bears. Spells like this at the Bears weren't uncommon. Lloyd playing six of the seven backline positions in the space of seven weeks, switching in consecutive weeks from wing to centre to 10 to fullback to nine to fullback to 10. Over 82 games for Bristol, Lloyd played the same position three or more weeks in a row just 
twice. Hilariously, back to back in 2021, never once hitting that hallowed fourth game in a row wearing the same shirt. And yet, since finding the only club in Britain and Ireland somehow more unserious than Bristol Bears, Lloyd has been used almost exclusively as a 10, starting 11 of the Scarlet's 13 games so far this season, 9 of them at fly half with 2 runouts at fullback to accommodate the aforementioned Mr Costello. And it was of course in his newfound first choice position that he ran out at Twickenham a few weeks ago, where Lloyd would put in the most himself performance Test Rugby has seen in some time. Whilst you could argue definitely, and I see your argument, it's better for a fly off on their first test start to take too many risks than retreat into their scarlet shell, Johan Lloyd's performance at Twickenham was hardly one to settle the nerves of Welsh fans. This cross kick is beautifully executed, but an inherently chaotic option in a game so tight. His performance was one of beautiful skill married to unnecessary risk. This is the moment that will likely linger long in Cymru's minds. Lloyd looking to make the most of Cymru's two-man advantage by making a stupid decision in the face of Mauro Bloody Atoje. And whilst any game he plays of the Scarlet's awful Wales have been stuffed with similar moments of balling before brain, there is a real proper playmaking talent show. Against Scotland here, Lloyd's execution of this launch play is exceptional. Williams goes off the top to Dyer, who misses Lloyd and hits Tompkins, a man gifted with an uncanny ability to make defenders just hit him, they just love to hit him, who times it perfectly to Lloyd, who's hidden himself out the back beautifully and then makes him the moment he gets the ball so obvious. Body language brilliant as he sells the pass to Grady before dropping it out the back instead to Dyer wrapping around, critically taking a hit from Russell as Rio plays it wide to Adams. Wales are now 20 metres over the game line and straight into shape, so much because of Lloyd's body language in that play, before he calls it out again, hitting Jenkins in order to condense the Scottish line, just two players able to fold around the corner as he wraps back into the 10 channel for part of two forwards off him. Except they break off, and surprise, one of the forwards was Nick Tompkins! We never see Nick Tompkins coming. Nailing a wide ball then to Dyer, who explodes up into the 22, giving a little bit of space. Under huge pressure, Scotland give away a penalty then, Wales go for the corner and from the resulting line out, Alex Mann crashes over for the first of what seemingly going to be a billion test tries. What you get in Johan Lloyd is a player incredibly talented, incredibly capable, incredibly able, just not very holistic. For 10 straight minutes here, Wales have been staring longingly at their own 22 metre line, wondering if they'll ever reach it. Maybe one day they'll even see the hallowed land known as halfway. And the moment they have a chance, the moment this long passage of defence ends, as Thomas Williams sets up to box kick, Lloyd spots something out wide. Despite having just found more legs for his pet caterpillar, Williams listens and wheels it back, and Lloyd hits the cross kick immediately. This is a call we saw Finn Russell, the gold standard of bollock brave mad maverick baller bastards, make himself against France last year, but with one key difference. Moa Farner here is the only French player covering this whole side of the pitch, so he can't really afford to backpedal before the kick comes in, just in case Finn slings it wide to Jones here, say. Meaning, much like an opponent Brian Habana once faced, Moa Farner is slow to turn, allowing Stain to catch into no pressure and gain a competitive advantage in rugby and in business. At Twickenham, however, Henry Slade spots Adams hogging the touchline immediately and drifts out whilst communicating brilliantly with Dingwall, who finds a realistic position to cover both North and win it here, allowing Slade to get out wide, put pressure on Adams, forcing him to drop the ball. This play is on, as Lloyd calls it, by the time the ball hits his boot, it's bordering on a suicide option. This is a classic first few caps mistake. Opportunity shut off so much quicker at test level than you do for your club, and yet the consequences, if you get it wrong, like Lloyd does here, are so much greater. It's just the sort of thing that he's going to have to learn from. Twickenham was ultimately a loss for Wales, but I don't think all the posh private school scholarships in the world could have provided Lloyd with as valuable an education as he got that day. The final third was a catalogue of tiny little game management errors, him failing to kick when it was on or remaining perhaps too happy to have a really bad ball for defence on top, yet it was invaluable for his development going forward. It's kind of the opposite problem to how Costello went against Scotland. With possession limited, slow, without many options, we saw Ronda's reddish son fall into the pocket instantly so many times, hanging predictable bombs into zones Scotland worked out pretty quickly. The attack became extremely easy to work out. If you could slow one rock down, Costello would resort to plan B at the drop of a hat, and that was simple to cover. Where, on the other hand, Lloyd in two separate passages at Twickenham, found himself managing a side going nowhere. No speed, no pace, no go forward. And instead of looking for a drop goal or kicking it away or varying up the tactics, he just went, yeah, crack on lads. It's a trend in the modern game. If a team goes beyond about six or seven phases, the chances of scoring a try go down further and further with each phase they subsequently play. Defenders more and more on top as attacks scramble more and more to organise. By phase five here, Wales have gained about four metres in total, and yet there's no thought of kicking. 
Freddie Stewart here has joined the defensive line, leaving England with just one guy in the backfield, and Cymru only requiring three points to win, yet even after losing all that ground, Lloyd allows England to continue swarming them, rushing them, driving them backwards until he eventually runs out of options, having lost 30 metres and goes for a terrible chip that isn't on at all. Instead of kicking when on top, in order to press advantage home, Lloyd waits until it's too late. Yeah, I think that's kind of him to a T. If the incumbent Welsh 10 is his era boiled down into one single player, Johan Lloyd is maybe the perfect fit for Wales right now. He might not have an all-round game yet, but his talent is obvious and beyond anything else, Johan Lloyd is committed. Every option, every decision, every tactic or choice he makes, he commits to 100%. If Wales are going to attack and Johan Lloyd's at 10, they're going to goddamn attack. He thinks they need to go for cross kicks. They will lean into cross kicks. And if he's going to back himself, he'd better get out of his goddamn way. I'm certain Johan Lloyd has an international future, but I wonder whether it might once again be as a utility back and impact server, player able to cover in this position to come off the bench to change the game, as happened against Scotland in the cases of emergency. This Six Nations is providing a pair of talented players with a beautiful opposition to dovetail and grow, both given chances to progress and expand their natural games. Lloyd's final quarter against England might have been ropey, but it's the sort of thing you only need to go through once to learn from. Because Wales, the Six Nations, are not a bad team. They're just incredibly easy to disrupt and get amongst. Both 10s struggle with slow ball and the attack tends to lose its shape when the fly-off isn't there to run it, which can be an issue when your 10 is as fond of involvement as these pair selectors so far can be. However, whilst Lloyd and Costello might be keeping the red shirt warm for now, there are other options starting to build under the national team with 2027 in view. And in particular, one young fella who just keeps getting better and better every week. The Ospreys' Dan Edwards is just 20 years of age, but since doing this on debut in his local derby against the Scar, Scarlets, you know, Lloyd Scarlets, he's been building a reputation within Wales at a pretty alarming rate. Outstanding for Wales in 20 last summer, the really exciting thing about Edwards isn't any particular aspect of his game, but how quickly he seems to learn and build on it. In last season 26 Nations, Edwards was a solid option who kicked well, could manage a game, but never really got Wales' attack firing very much. Yet by the summer, he was setting the place alight, creating and indeed scoring tries for fun. So good at calling shapes like this. Where in his time Costello hit the inside line and used his own pace, Edwards instead calls this shape, identifying the Kiwi forwards are honey potting around the ruck, knowing if Hughes can nail the pass to Bradley here, really there's only two defenders to take out. Hennessy at 13 here hits his line brilliantly, allowing Edwards just to fade, and his fade is fantastic, going from a drift to a dart, knowing he's on the outside them to scoot under the posts. An Osprey's 10 named Dan is always going to draw a really obvious comparison, but Edwards does have a kind of Gen Z reboot energy of Dan Bigger. Where Dan Senior was fiery and confrontational in his confidence, Edwards is laid back yet possesses an unbelievable self-belief, best seen in his recent last-minute winning drop goal against the heavily favoured Ulster. As Osprey's coach Toby Booth said afterwards, the kick is one thing, but the setup play and decision to take free was entirely Edwards' call, and not for a second did Dan doubt his ability to do so, nailing the three-pointer and swanning off to celebrate. Yet his influence in attack is growing. Moments like the try against the Scarlets and this gorgeous kick against the grain, perfect for a muddy pitch for Keelan Giles to score, are eye-catching, but the smaller elements of his game, the way he manages an attack, is developing at an incredible rate. Yesin Hopkins here, another really promising youngster, makes a fantastic carry on the counter-attack to kick us off, and Edwards slips into the boot here, always assessing the defence out wide, eyes very much out on the wing. He calls for the ball and gives it early, allowing Giles to put Williams onto a weak seam in the defence. On the back foot, he sees the lines are offering no line speed, so Edwards calls for the carry as he reloads, fainting to the forwards before going out the back to Giles again, who brings Deves onto the ball. The Ospreys are now in total ascendancy, and Edwards flashes around the corner last second, the the winger up and drops it onto the toe. Pressure from Provero forcing Mahambe to carry it out. From the line out, Edward slips into the exact quarterback role Gatlin tends to have for so long, so often played in the 22, controlling shape where the forwards carry, calling exactly what he wants, where he wants them to go, yet never really touching the ball himself. Assessing where the defence is weakest, eventually drawing a penalty, which he knocks over himself. His recent rise has been meteoric. That performance against Olsen netted Edward's man of the match, yet like Costello against Georgia, I think it kind of did prove exactly where he's at. There's some incredible moments. The drop goal speaks for itself, but his touch finding is phenomenal, and there's some lovely game management such as this kick to turn the fullback. Well, this attack is almost brilliant. After a scrappy start, Deves makes a great carry and Edwards fills into his boot with the aim of loading into position next phase. The forward pack is out of the game. Edwards' sole goal now is taking out defensive captain James Hume, getting him on the ground, getting him out of the game. He hits Bosch off, who charges straight at him, and Bosch with Potter forwards on the far side to wrap around quickly, knowing Ulster's defensive leader is tied in by Provero. Morse carries into the gap created with tips on his tip, and as the ball comes out, he tries to call for Kieran Williams to hit this inside line, as Ulster are pushing right off. Off, however, the two 
sense it's getting each other's way here, so he has to adapt a bit and shuffles it onto Walsh, who just gets smothered. Twice here, Edwards almost finds an opening in Norse's defence, but twice it's shut down a split second. This is the learning from these last few games. On several occasions throughout that match against Ulster, Edwards found himself closed off, still adapting to the step up in speed and intensity of URC rugby when compared to under-20s and Welsh Prem. And he threw hospital passes. Balls he shouldn't have. This one to Sekakete, resulting in a knock-on in a promising position. The Ospreys here have a kid with all the talent, ability and bottle in the world, but one who is still adjusting to pro rugby. That Ulster match was just his fourth start for the Ospreys and a major coming of age confidence building performance, but also one that said to me, his time will come, but it isn't right now. USC stands at a few seconds faster than under 20s, age grade, Welsh Premiership and international rugby is a major step up beyond. And Edwards' strong performances are still filled with the odd error that feel to me not down to any issues with his game, with his skill set, but rather the mere knack for adjusting to the speed required, the quality of the defence. Something that only comes with, as Toby Booth puts it, time in the saddle. Edwards may yet be the future of this jersey, the man to wear in 2027, but for me it would be a mistake to rush his development and make him try it on for the first time right away. And yet, once again, if the Welsh 10 is a reflection of his time, any talk around Edwards reflects the situation in which Wales currently find themselves. Considering I didn't so much as say the words Sam Prendergast when having a similar conversation on Ireland a few weeks ago. Because the trio discussed already represent just the tipperick of the iceberg. In a race with only a marginal front runner, it's only once you dip into the pack of proper that you start to understand the situation. There's around a dozen options for Wales right now, but nobody truly standing out. I really like Will Reed at the Dragons. He's a kind of pound shop George Ford, but it's almost impossible for a kid like him to really kick on in the team set up to lose by 15 points or more every single week but I think he's got proper talent he could probably go somewhere Jared Evans left Cardiff for Quinns in the offseason and has continued to show the world his unique brand of sherbet coloured chaos a player with all the talent out there but perhaps lacking some of the tactical discipline and ability to control his wilder impulses Ben Thomas is a proper talent but has developed into more of a utility back game time at 10 extreme limited while Callum Sheedy fell out of favour after some poor form in 2022 but is clearly plotting a comeback after signing for Cardiff for next season Owen Williams had a proper run in the shirt last year, a very calm, collected, patient fly half. In many ways, he is everything Wales are missing right now, everything they're lacking, but at age 32, any international future is likely as a mentor or studying hand off the bench if either the scarlet shaped kamikaze twins ever go too far. While neither Anscombe nor Patchell are officially retired from Test Rugby, meaning both may yet be available again in a year or so's time. And then there is the third fly half currently in the squad, though really he stumbled out of the functional fullback factory somewhere in Bridge End. Blinking, bald, and coated in a smell all of regional rugby now recognises as Kai Evans. Son of legendary Wales captain Yian Evans, a man who retired Wales' record try scorer, a seven time Test Lion, and one of the fastest wingers the country ever produced, Kai Evans is a fullback come outside half who will make you ask the question just how slow was his mum? In rugby, father son and father daughter apples have rarely fallen as far from the tree as Yian and Kai Evans. Despite looking alike, where his dad was an excitement machine who single handedly won Wales games in the dire, dire 90s, Kai is positionally excellent, a superb goal kick having once nailed the shot late on to beat New Zealand in the 20s, great under the high ball, and armed with a pretty peachy boot. Evans is a really tidy player. He's vastly underrated, technically sound, and incredibly composed in almost all situations. Think Hugo Keenan if he lost all his pace with his hair in some twisted Samson situation. You're kind of halfway there. However, perhaps sensing an opening for a demi de overture, last year Evans moved from the Ospreys, where he was starting to make the fullback shirt his own, to the Dragons, where if you can stay stood up for a straight 80 minutes, you're in contention to start at 10. And since signing, Evans has been good, albeit in the 15 shirt. Evans has only started at 10 twice in senior rugby, both of them last December. One, an utter hammering at the hands of local rivals, the Cardiff Blues, and the other against Poe, where I guess he kind of technically assisted um, this, this try. Technically, goes down as an assist for him, I guess. And when this is your sole highlight as a pro in the 10 jersey, it kind of makes recommending you as an international fly half difficult, no matter your level of talent. Because this is becoming a theme. In round two, Johan Lloyd found himself in the latest dangers of a two-point game a tight contest that, for Wales, was there for the winning. That match was Johan Lloyd's 100th game of top flight rugby. And yet, a career bouncing between positions for Bristol and playing a Scarlet's team conceding an average of 36 points per game meant Lloyd had only found himself in that situation, playing 10 in the final few minutes of a game decided by 7 points or fewer, 3 times over his entire senior career. One of those was this season. Cardiff kicked the 76th minute penalty to get back within 7 here, leaving him 4 minutes 
to manage. The other two were for Bristol. In February 2021, Lloyd, like Evans, went into this Six Nations chronically underprepared to deal with the situations he would be forced to handle in the dying minutes at Twickenham, and the blame for that should not lie at all on his shoulders, but somewhere else entirely. In 1974, Max Boyce told us all a story, a strange and weird tale, of a factory in his valley not fed by road or rail. Boyce didn't tell us about the spot where outside halves grew on trees or in the ground. He didn't write of how Welsh tent were conjured by the dreams and wishes of a nation. He didn't tell us a story of magic and wonder. He told us about a factory. Max Boyce's iconic poem, The Outside Half Factory, tracks Boyce himself, his father, the bloke called Rom, but primarily Harry Dampers, an old timer with dust laid on his chest, who, as the poem hits its final verse, receives his final call, passing away to go and meet the greatest Welsh ten of them all. Boyce is a former miner, almost eight years spent in the pits before finding other work at a metal box factory in Neath. Whenever discussing his work, his poems, his output, everybody always talks about Max's naked love for rugby union, an uncanny ability to capture the colour it gave life in South Wales in the 70s. Yet one of Boyce's biggest hits, the outside half factory, infamously recorded at Treorchy Rugby Club in 1974, is not about rugby at all. It's not a song about outside halves or Wales' enduring obsession with them. It's a song about a factory. It's a song about Welshmen and more specifically it's a song about Welsh workers finding life in a job with nothing but grim conditions. There's a reason he name drops four employees but just one Welsh ten. The big theme throughout Boyce's early work, the stuff from the 70s that coincided with Wales being the best rugby team in the world, is not rugby but men, workers, Welsh folk under exploitative, horrible conditions, finding joy and light in lives where they would so often be without it in a very little sense every single daytime. As Boyce sung elsewhere on Live in Treorchy, I can't forget the times we had laughing midst the fear, because every time I cough, I get a mining souvenir. The Outside Half Factory is a song about workers finding colour in a grey life and doing that through rugby. It endures in Wales not because of how it expresses how much we love outside halves, but because there is something universal to every sports fan who's ever had a shit time, a mental collapse or ill health about Harry Damper's health troubles seeming to disappear as he watches Wales score the winning try. The poem endures because it remains true. Over five decades since Max put pen to paper and song to lips, rugby has become a professional game and the situation has changed. Prior to being thrown into that final 10 minutes at Twickenham, Johan Lloyd hadn't faced that situation in three years. Kai Evans had played a top flight match at 10 just twice. Reed, Evans, Patchell, Thomas, Anscombe, Williams had all been stuck playing in teams that can't win because in the years since Boyce gave us all an anthem, the players themselves had become the workers, giving so much pouring themselves fully into situations that quite frankly have been exploitative. Every year, the IRFU and WRU make similar amounts of money. And yet, where just over 50% of that money in Ireland is reinvested into the four provinces, their academies and pathways, and player contracts, around 22% of the WRU's annual budget is poured into the players. Last year, the Welsh squad threatened strike action on the day of the England game, Welsh rugby's biggest earner every two years, because despite promises it would be finished in December, the WRU was yet to put in place framework that would allow players at the four regions, the four professional clubs, to sign new contracts, leaving over 100 players not knowing if they would have a job in just over two months time. And even when they got the framework in place, there were enormous budget cuts. When pre-season began last year, Cardiff had just eight players on the books, and the Ospreys went the entire pre-season without being to practice live scrums against themselves because they didn't have enough bodies to do so. For years, the regions have been underfunded, undersupported, and the pathway structures underneath insufficient. It's no surprise that so many bright talents such as Lloyd are now coming through the English clubs when for two full generations, Wales' most talented young players have been squeezed through underfunded pathways into uncompetitive teams, forcibly Irish, Scottish, now Italian teams with vastly superior budgets, and these days South African sides on similar financial standing in a country with the cost of living is 94% lower. There's long been questions over whether Wales should cut a region, whether we should be divvying up that 22% differently, but in 2022, the W advertised a job organising trips, events and parties for members of the W board and committee. That month, as Cumbria played the Springboks, then Chief Executive Steve Phillips' entire extended family went on a month-long safari holiday paid for by the union, all whilst regional players in good form and playing regularly started apprenticeships and job hunts because he had no idea if there'd be a contract for them to play the following season. Despite taking huge swathes of the W board to France for a World Cup jolly, the regional budget is due to come down by a further million next 
next season. Which means squad sizes will likely be slashed to around 35 players. At the time of that Lions game, I showed Dan Edwards controlling so well a moment ago, the Ospreys had 26 players injured. For those unaware, a rugby team consists of 15 players, plus a bench of 8. Max could not have written a more perfect song if he tried. The players, the workers themselves, have been used, exploited and treated as disposable by the WRU. Those who get injured, left feeling for their jobs and who remain fit, flogged, playing 80 minutes every week and struggling teams because there's nobody else left to fulfil the places. And it's left us in a situation where our brightest talents are having to learn to manage games away at Twickenham in the bloody Six Nations instead of in tight games in the URC. Ireland had a similar exodus at 10 with Sexton retired and Ross Byrne injured, yet whilst Jack Crowley and Harry Byrne have just one cap more between them than Costello had on his own. Both had been playing competitive, winning Munster and Leinster teams respectively for at least three years. There isn't a player in that Ireland squad who hadn't been operating at the highest possible level of club competition. Most of them challenging for silverware year on year and used to playing in huge European and URC knockout games. Where Wales, through necessity, had three players in the team that faced Ireland last week who had won three games or fewer of professional rugby in their life. The WU's chronic mismanagement has left Wales in an impossible situation. The reason Dan Edwards feels like such a bright white spark of glorious hope is because he's at the Ospreys, the only region currently competitive in the USC, and the only side in the knockouts of either European competition, and a team doing an incredible job of developing young talent despite the WU rather than because of it. Thanks to the decision to bring in head coach Toby Booth and director Mike Ruddock, two men who've done incredible work shepherding youngsters to test caps and lines places in the English and Irish systems respectively over decades gone by, now bringing their expertise to Wales. The incumbent of the Welsh 10 shirt has always reflected what the game at that moment means to Wales. And right now, regardless of which direction Gatlin goes, I think we're seeing a fair reflection. Rugby in Wales right now is in a flawed state, but not through fault of the players. The WOU has crippled the game below national level in the name of self-interest, and as the scandals pile up higher and higher, we find ourselves instead drawn to the colour coming through elsewhere. The colour that Max Boyce looked for 50 years ago. The last year has seen an unprecedented amount of young Welsh talent take the big time. Regions flooded with kids who can do no wrong. Coming into sides, stepping up, and across the board, thriving. We've seen Cardiff unearth an amazing crop of homegrown kids who would die for the black and blue. Starting to push teams with ten times their budget close every single week. We've seen the Dragons keep on fighting week on week. Players like Wainwright, Dyer and Dee becoming talismanic. We've seen the Ospreys do the impossible, finding a way with a team of kids. We've also seen the Scarlets. Sam Costello, Johan Lloyd, Kai Evans and Dan Edwards are all, each and every one of them, currently flawed players. But they're all young, with incredible talent and unbelievably high ceilings, one and all. Rugby in Wales right now might be in a very different place to six years ago, but if we only keep on believing in these kids, investing in these kids and championing these kids, days like those that made Harry Dampers forget his failing health and feel like everything was going to be okay, may just be here once again before we know it. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. This has been a long, ongoing project. Started this in January and didn't want to push it out until it was ready, until it was finished. So hence it taking a while, that's something we want to do with this channel, you know, changing up the things are going. We're not going to preview for the games this week because, you know, we've had this, we've had the FB video, we've had the Borthwick one last week. So we've been kind of working on a lot of things that have been running on. But we do head in the final few weeks of the Six Nations. So with that coming up, we've got some other stuff coming up afterwards, some different things as well as some of the usual stuff. So it's all very exciting. Please have a look around. We've also done a podcast once again, back again, going over old World Cup matches. We've looked this week at one of the most famous games of all time, the game between France and New Zealand in the 2007 Rugby World Cup, the quarterfinal, the infamous quarterfinal, the Thierry Ducer to our game. Uh, one of the most famous, one of the most brilliant, kind of dramatic games you'll ever see. We've done a two-hour deep dive on that, so please go and listen to that. And otherwise, we'll see you very soon next week when the Six Nations returns for more rugby. Tell you what, he said, I tell you what, you take two foot of the kidney beans, he said, and I'll blow the candles out. <laughs>